I compiled the following video last night, featuring some of the most brutal shark attacks covered on the channel thus far. This includes the horrifying true story of a pair of abalone divers who practically had their entire bodies get caught between the jaws of what was allegedly the same 6 meter long great white shark, a notorious shark attack that was caught on film in Australian waters during a documentary shoot, a shark attack that was so gruesome that no remains of the victim were found despite intense search efforts and much more. You're watching nature's most brutal shark attacks. Welcome to the enigmatic world of sharks, where the beauty and mystery of the ocean converge with the awe-inspiring presence of these powerful creatures. As more people venture into the depths of the sea, the line between fascination and fear becomes increasingly blurred. In this video, we'll delve into a chilling encounter that shook the nation of Australia and was one of the first incidents of its kind to spark greater awareness of the risks associated with exploring the underwater realm. This is the harrowing true story of Henry Bourse. Henry Bourse's journey from Rotterdam to Australia opened up new possibilities for his adventurous spirit. With the mesmerizing allure of its beaches drawing him in, Henry eagerly plunged into the crystal clear waters at a young age, testing his limits and consistently pushing himself to new heights. He discovered his passion for scuba diving during his teenage years, showing an impressive aptitude for taking risks and mastering the craft. Under the guidance of his father, Henry learned to use an aqualung, also known as a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, or scuba for short, a device that allows divers to breathe underwater for extended periods. It was this very experience that would set Henry on course towards a life of adventure and exploration. On a seemingly ordinary Sunday on November 29th of 1964, Henry and his companions would embark on a diving expedition to Lady Julia Percy Island, located about 22 kilometers from Port Ferry. The island, a result of volcanic activity dating back millions of years, is a truly breathtaking sight. In fact, one of the largest breeding colonies of Australian fur seals inhabit the island, which of course also attracts some of the ocean's most formidable predators. Sharks. Particularly for scuba divers, this fact highlights the importance of being aware of the time of the day and the position of the sun when diving in areas where great white sharks are known to be present. With an estimated 27,000 seals calling the island home, the water surrounding it not just teemed with life, but also of an ever-present possibility of a spine-chilling shark encounter. Brimming with anticipation, Henry and his team arrive at the island, eagerly preparing for their dive. Adorned in a sleek black wetsuit accented with vivid yellow stripes, Henry meticulously readies his camera equipment, his sights set on capturing the majestic bull seals he had spotted earlier. Just as he's about to enter the water, he overhears his companions exchanging a tale of terror. They were recalling how the locals spoke of a notorious great white shark known as Big Ben, and rumors suggested that this shark was a creature of monstrous proportions and was said to measure an estimated 20 feet in length. Despite their initial skepticism, the gruesome details of this creature's legend would grip Henry and his companions, rendering them unable to resist discussing it, regardless of the fact that they're about to enter the water. Undeterred by the potential danger implied by what would in hindsight be a very timely telling of this story, Henry remains unaware of the dramatic turn his day is about to take, one that will forever alter the trajectory of his life. With the sun's rays warming his back, Henry descends into the depths around 12.45 p.m., clutching his camera firmly and eager to expand his collection of underwater imagery. At approximately 1.15 p.m., Henry resurfaces discontent with the ordinary footage he had just captured solo, which is when he asks two of his companions, Dietrich and Fred, to accompany him on a second dive. As the men free dive together, the trio encounters seals playfully cavorting amidst the waves. This is when Henry begins filming a bull seal within its harem, but the forceful swells make it challenging to maintain focus on his subjects. Suddenly, a staggering impact jolts him, and a petrified Henry soon realizes that his leg is ensnared between the jaws of a gargantuan great white shark. He tries to scream for help, but only a muffled gurgle emerges from his saltwater-filled mouth. 
A traumatized Henry's life begins flashing before his eyes as he confronts the chilling prospect that he may in moments be just another statistic in the growing list of reported shark attacks. Dietmar and Fred, who had been swimming nearby, hear the commotion and turn to see Henry trapped between the massive jaws of the Great White. The men would freeze in terror as they spot one of Henry's legs protruding from the blood-tainted water. Realizing that time was of the essence, the men had no room for hesitation and so courageously snap into action, swimming towards Henry as fast as they could, spear guns in hand. With adrenaline surging through their veins, they initially charge at the shark without firing, hoping to frighten it away. But the formidable apex predator remains undeterred, continuing to bite into a helpless Henry. Suddenly Henry would disappear below the surface as the shark would begin dragging him violently into deeper water. Henry's vision begins blurring as he fights to stay conscious, his body racked with pain and exhaustion. Just when all hope seems lost, Dietmar and Fred, who were following all along, managed to get close enough to the shark before it accelerated any quicker, managing to strike it with their spears multiple times, causing the shark to recoil in pain, finally allowing Henry to break free and swim towards the surface. With the assistance of his heroic companions, Henry reaches the boat, where he receives immediate first aid for his gruesome injuries. With his life hanging by a thread, he's then rushed to emergency surgery, where doctors worked frantically to save his mutilated body and battled to repair his torn flesh and shattered bones as his vital signs dangerously waver. Defying all odds, Henry would go on to survive what was a gruesome attack after undergoing extensive surgery and a grueling rehabilitation process. The ordeal left him with not just a newfound appreciation for life, but it also inspired him to vow to continue to explore the ocean despite the mental trauma the incident caused him, which to many upon hearing this demonstrated the incredible depth of human resilience. Henry would go on to produce a documentary called Savage Shadows, featuring actual footage of the attack and a gripping reenactment. His story till today serves as a cautionary tale for beachgoers and swimmers, emphasizing the importance of taking precaution and being aware of the risks associated with ocean activities. Many people went on to assume that the legendary Big Ben was the culprit behind the brutal attack on Henry, and experts would also go on to speculate on the possible triggers of the shark's aggression towards Henry. Upon further investigation, many theories would suggest that the scent of a dog he had petted on shore just hours prior to the dive, as well as the bright yellow stripes on his swimsuit, may have allured the shark to Henry causing it to think of him as potential prey. Henry Borse's harrowing experience teaches us that the ocean, while a place of wonder and adventure, demands caution, and as we venture into the vast and mysterious waters of our world, his incredible story continues to stand as a strong example of why we should do so with the utmost care and reverence for the incredible creatures that call it home. In the treacherous waters of Cape Howe, Australia, Eric Nurhus, a seasoned abalone diver, and his son Mark would on a fateful day in January of 2007 find themselves facing the unimaginable during a routine dive. Ironically enough, Mark had a nagging intuition that something wasn't quite right, but neither of them could have anticipated the life-changing encounter with a great white shark that lay ahead. This is the harrowing true story of Eric Nurhus' gruesome encounter with one of our ocean's most formidable predators. The region around Cape Howe is known for its diverse and unique wildlife. The nearby waters host a variety of marine life, including whales, dolphins, seals, and various species of fish. The beaches and coastal dunes are home to a range of bird species, including the threatened hooded plover and the eastern bristol bird. Not to mention the surrounding forests are also home to a variety of animals, including kangaroos, wallabies, echidnas, and possums. The region is particularly important for its populations of threatened species, such as the long-nosed potteroo, the spotted-tailed coal, and the majestic owl. The strong currents of Cape Howe are known for attracting fish and the seals that feed on them, which of course is a favorite meal of none other than the great white shark. As the top predator in these waters, great whites are undoubtedly a force to be reckoned with and are perfectly adapted for their roles in the food chain. 
On Tuesday morning of January 23, 2007, Eric Neris and his 25-year-old son Mark, joined by a group of fellow divers, embarked on an underwater adventure in the Tasman Sea. Their destination was Cape Howe, a captivating spot situated roughly 250 miles south of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. The spot was one that Eric was very much familiar with and was specifically located on the northern side of Cape Howe in New South Wales. Eric had been submerged in approximately 26 feet of water, intently following trail of abalone on the sea floor, which lay atop the coral reef. He would during this time focus on ensuring that the abalone was of the proper size, diligently examining each specimen. Once gathered, he'd then place the abalone into a bag and send it up to Mark on the boat right above him. Descending into the depths, Eric moved gracefully among the boulders and kelp, expertly collecting abalone, and it wasn't long before he would fill his first bag and send it up to Mark, who was diligently following his father's air bubbles. Despite the lurking danger, a carefree Eric found himself lulled into a peaceful daydream by the hum of his regulator. That tranquility was shattered when, without warning, Eric was hit with a force so immense he thought he'd been struck by a truck underwater. One second it was daylight, the next second everything went black and a really nasty vice-like pressure crushing my chest and upper back and I wasn't really sure what had actually happened to me. And it was at this point that he would realize that his head and shoulders were gripped between the jaws of a 10-foot great white shark. Aided by a surge of adrenaline, Eric's survival instincts then kick in. With one arm trapped in the shark's mouth, he uses his free hand to gouge at the shark's eye. With its razor-sharp teeth unable to penetrate Eric's lead diving vest, the animal would regardless of this continue its brutal attack, shaking Eric back and forth in an attempt to saw through his body, as it often does when attempting to rip chunks of blubber and fat off of its prey. Fearing the worst, Eric continued to fight back, focusing on inflicting as much pain as he possibly could on the shark. This was when, to his amazement, the shark would suddenly release him, but to his horror, the shark did not retreat, but instead began circling him, waiting for him to weaken further before coming in for the final blow, a tactic they often use when hunting seals. According to shark experts, sharks may circle their prey and wait for them to bleed out because it conserves energy and minimizes the risk of injury. Sharks have a limited energy reserve, and chasing prey can be energetically costly especially for larger prey. By circling prey, the shark can monitor it and wait for it to become weakened from loss of blood or injury, making it easier to kill and consume. This behavior may also minimize the risk of injury to the shark as the prey becomes weaker and less capable of defending itself. And interestingly, circling behavior may be a way for the shark to assess the potential risk and value of its prey. By observing the prey's behavior and assessing its injuries, the shark can determine whether the prey is worth the effort and or the risk of attacking. It's also important to note that not all shark species exhibit this behavior, and the behavior can vary depending on the species, prey, and environmental conditions. Determined to survive, Eric then makes the difficult decision to swim to the surface, knowing that any sudden movement could provoke the shark to strike again. He spreads his arms and legs wide, hoping to appear less like a seal and more like an unfamiliar creature. Like something out of a horror movie, upon breaking the surface, Eric would spot the menacing blackish-blue eyes of the Great White creeping in from just below him and circling his flippers. And as fear coursed through his body in the form of yet another surge of adrenaline, he would then call out to Mark at the top of his lungs, who quickly helped him out of the water before the shark could strike again. A snowy hydro rescue helicopter would arrive at the scene and Eric would be transported to the Wollongong Hospital instead of the closer Canberra facility, a decision which was made in order to allow the helicopter to maintain a lower altitude during the flight, preventing patients from experiencing decompression sickness, which often occurs when nitrogen bubbles form in the bloodstream, much like when one ascends too quickly when scuba diving. Upon receiving Eric, a snowy hydro rescue person noted that he was conscious and alert but exhibited a broken nose and lacerations on both sides of his torso and chest, consistent with bite marks. The hospital reported Eric to be in serious but stable condition, with his injuries requiring a total of 75 stitches. Miraculously, Eric would go on to survive the attack, though his wounds were extensive. He had suffered a broken arm, a broken nose, 
and had four of the Great White's teeth embedded in the back of his skull. Reflecting on his close call, Eric would go on to state that had it not been for his lead weight vest, he likely wouldn't be alive, and it was what saved him from what was sure to be a much more gruesome and likely lethal shark bite. Grateful for his second chance at life, Eric eventually left abalone fishing to work as a security officer on dry land. Shark attacks are not uncommon in Australian waters, with an average of 15 attacks occurring each year, and statistics show that at least one of those is likely to be fatal. An attack specifically by great whites, which breed in the cold southern waters of Australia, are particularly dangerous due to their sheer size. Sharks are apex predators, and play a vital role in maintaining the balance of marine ecosystems. However, interactions between humans and sharks have the potential to be dangerous and even deadly. While shark attacks are rare, they still do occur, and the consequences of course can be severe, as this channel is covered in several other episodes. In addition to the physical harm caused by an attack, the fear and trauma associated with the experience can also have lasting psychological effects. By exercising caution when swimming in these waters, and following safety guidelines, such as avoiding swimming during dusk and dawn when sharks are most active, staying in groups, and not wearing shiny jewelry, individuals can help minimize the risk of encountering a curious shark. Eric's experience serves as a stark reminder of the power and unpredictability of nature, and though shark attacks are rare, they undoubtedly can still occur, and being prepared for the unexpected is vital. With determination and a will to survive, Eric Neeris overcame the odds and lived to tell his incredible story. Then given a second chance, um, it makes a great deal of difference to your life and all of a sudden you start to appreciate things that you didn't even think about before. We're knowing that I could have lost the best thing in my life and like, I just don't know how to say it. Like, there's no words that can literally say it. The following story is widely considered one of the most gruesome shark attacks caught on camera. This horrifying attack took place just off the coast of Little Bay, near Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. With its sparkling waterfront consisting of photo-esque harbors, polished beaches, and vibrant city life, it's no wonder that Sydney is known as one of the world's prime tourist locations for vacationers, swimmers, and outdoor enthusiasts alike. Little Bay, on the other hand, is a much more secluded spot situated along the outskirts of Sydney. And due to its much less densely populated and industrialized beachfront, it's a prime location for those with a preference for a quieter, more authentic experience at the bay. To further add to its marvel, it is also one of the most eco-friendly coastal regions in Australia, both in terms of water clarity and bacterial count. The bay also consistently hosts an abundance of recreational activities, both on land and in the water. Ranging from its scenic golf clubs to its large surfing waves that crash over the shoreline, it's no wonder why the bay is known as one of the most perfect locations for surfers and adrenaline junkies alike. Little Bay is also known for having a very low amount of fatal shark attacks, with only one occurring roughly every 60 years. This of course is an assuring statistic for tourists, as it's no secret that Australia is known for having one of the largest populations of great white sharks around the world. Having recently retired from the British Royal Air Force, 35-year-old Simon Nellist was just settling in in Australia to get married to his recent fiance Jessie Ho, who he was in a long-distance relationship with at the time. Simon was an experienced scuba diver and dive instructor, and by all accounts was extremely excited to live near the coast so that he could make swimming and scuba diving a part of his regular routine. Simon always loved the outdoors, and now that he was living just a few kilometers away from the bay, this was most certainly an opportunity that he wasn't going to let go to waste. Shortly after moving into his new home, Simon would sign up to a local swimming race called the Malabar Magic Ocean Swim, which was set to take place on the 20th of February, 2022. And since he lived so close to the bay, Simon would go for a swim for at least half an hour each day in preparation for the event. On the warm Wednesday evening of February the 16th, Simon dons his black wetsuit and sets out to the shoreline of Bucan Point, a small peninsula of Little Bay that due to its rocky and uncomfortable seabed is rarely used by other swimmers, allowing Simon to finish his laps uninterrupted. As he takes his first steps into the warm water of the lagoon, he observes several fishermen casting their lines off the steep cliff above him. 
and so does his best to avoid being hit by their hooks as he continues to advance with each stroke further and further away from the beach. After swimming out against a strong breeze pushing him back towards the beach, Simon comes to a halt about 150 meters away from the shore, which is when as he usually would, he'd start practicing his familiar strokes, sinking into a deep trance as he repeats the same motions he always had for years. An estimated 15 foot long great white suddenly emerges from the depths of the crystal blue water. It's important to note that sharks have an exceptional hearing ability that allows them to find prey before being detected, and they do this with their supreme ability to sense low frequency vibrations in the water, such as the ones made by a wounded fish. The shark then continues to move closer towards the shore of the rocky lagoon while simultaneously searching for any movement, and as Simon continues practicing his strokes, with his back facing the open ocean, his vibrations on the surface of the water are unknowingly attracting this great white. As it closes in on Simon's location, it quickly spots a large figure moving through each wave, which is when it begins zeroing in on him. When great whites prey on the surface of the ocean, they do so by breaching the water and launching themselves into the air with their jaws wide open, allowing its prey to fall deep into its mouth so they can clamp down to secure their grip. This in turn of course causes devastating damage to the vital organs of its unfortunate victims. In fact, these ancient super predators are known for their ability to breach the surface of the water, leaping up to 10 feet in the air. This behavior is often seen as a predatory hunting technique or as a form of communication, and even today scientists still do not fully understand the reason for this behavior, whereas some theories suggest that breaching helps the sharks dislodge parasites from their skin, others suggest that it may be a way for them to intimidate rivals or even attract mates. The Great White is now only a few meters away from an oblivious Simon, and just as he changes direction while he's swimming, the colossal 1000 kg Great White breaches through the surface of the water underneath Simon forcefully launching him high up in the air as a shark clamps down on his torso, causing severe damage to his internal organs and limbs. The shark then crashes down into the water, causing an immensely loud noise that alerts everyone in the nearby area. It's at this point that the water around Simon begins turning blood red, as he desperately attempts to swim away from the shark with the little remaining power that he had left. He then somehow manages to free himself from the immense grip of the shark, and for a very brief moment, he attempts to swim away from it desperately with all that he had left in him. The fishermen on the beach, who at this point are frozen in shock from what they're witnessing, look on in horror as a shark once again latches onto him and begins violently shaking him from side to side, sending large splashes of bloody water and flesh across the lagoon, visibly ripping entire limbs off of Simon's body and mortally wounding him in the process. Some of the fishermen suddenly break out at this point from their paralyzed state and signal for help to the lifeguards who are on a nearby beach. One of the eyewitnesses would then pull out his phone and begin reporting the now infamous video. And while a majority of shark attacks haven't been caught on camera, this video perfectly encapsulates just how terrifying the experience would be for anyone unfortunate enough to experience it. And just as the seconds of the attack seem to turn to hours for those watching on, the shark finally disappears at this point below the surface, never to be seen again. Just as a side note, I've uploaded a version of this video to my Rumble and Patreon accounts. You can watch it for free on Rumble. Here are the usernames, I'll pop it up on the screen for you. I wasn't able to post it here due to this platform's much stricter restrictions, especially nowadays when it comes to content that it deems too sensitive or inappropriate. Authorities arrived very quickly on the scene, and after a short but intensive search, they were able to locate Simon's remains floating in the water. It was later believed by the investigators that the shark likely mistook Simon for a seal due to the black wetsuit he was wearing. Simon Nellis was set to marry the love of his life only shortly after the attack, but tragically, he and Jesse would never get to live out their dream together. While many frequent goers of Little Bay would agree that swimming in its waters comes with the inherent risk of a shark attack, this would once again be only the first unprovoked fatal shark attack in its waters since the 1960s making it all the more tragic for a man who otherwise was about to live the dream life he always wanted. In the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, a single week in July 1975 would prove to be one of the rarest and most harrowing periods in the history of known shark encounters. 
Within a span of just five days, two separate divers, Gary Johnson and Rob Repstock, would experience the sheer terror of coming face to face with one of our ocean's most formidable predators, the Great White Shark. These chilling attacks, taking place mere kilometers apart, would not only become an enduring symbol of the unpredictability and power of the ocean, but also present a series of inexplicable coincidences that would captivate and puzzle shark experts for decades. Hit that like and subscribe button if you're new. You're watching When Sharks Attack. When it comes to shark attacks, throughout the 1900s, a number of studies found that divers were at most risk when compared to other groups, such as surfers, swimmers, and kayakers. In fact, out of 108 recorded unprovoked shark attacks along the Pacific coast of North America, 50 of them, or 46%, involved individuals engaged in diving. In 90% of these instances, or 45 out of the 50 cases analyzed, the Great White was identified as the species responsible for these attacks. On the morning of Saturday, July 19, 1975, 34-year-old commercial abalone diver Gary Johnson would embark on a diving trip off the coast of California. The seasoned diver was equipped with his black wetsuit, hood, boots, swim fins, and a mask featuring a stainless steel rim. Along with his net basket and a gray aluminum abalone iron, Johnson utilized the hookah line with a regulator for his air supply. As he entered the water, Johnson observed several harbor seals basking on a rock formation nearby. Unbeknownst to him, the presence of these seals had already attracted a massive great white shark. As Johnson began his dive around 400 to 450 meters away from the shore, he would within minutes begin prying abalone from the underside of a ledge, which is when he suddenly felt something seize his right swim fin and begin to shake it vigorously. An alarm Johnson would then turn to face the source of the disturbance, an enormous great white shark. Great white sharks are known to rely on their keen sense of vision to locate prey, and they usually do this in murky water, which is why it's likely that this shark mistook him for a seal and launched an attack. The shark then released Johnson's fin and would begin circling him, getting menacingly close several times before disappearing the murky depths. For several agonizing moments, Johnson spun around, desperately trying to maintain sight of the shark. The shark would then return and make five more passes, each time coming dangerously close to Johnson, but to his good fortune, it would lose interest and leave him unharmed, though his swim fin did bore five thin slices on its upper and lower surfaces. Although Johnson would survive the horrifying encounter, the encounter with what he estimated to be a five to six meter long great white shark would forever be etched in Johnson's memory. Just five days later, on July 23, 1975, the sun shone brightly as sports scuba diver Robert Repstock and his companions, his brother Scott, Jeff Morris, and Tom Hesselbens, set out for an adventure dive at Point Conception. With excitement in the air, little did they know of the life-changing event that lay ahead. As the group anchored their boat just 10 meters south of Perch Rock, they prepared their equipment, their anticipation for their dive, growing with each passing moment. Rebstock, clad in a black wetsuit, green swim fins, and carrying a yellow pole spear, entered the water with a backward roll. The ocean surface seemed serene to him, giving no hint of the lurking danger just meters away. As Rebstock resurfaced, he trod water for a few moments while his companions handed him additional gear. But within a minute, everything changed. A massive white shark, estimated to be five to six meters long, would suddenly emerge from the depths of the murky waters. It's important to note that on the same day, Robert Repstock and his crew had actually run in to Gary Johnson before boarding their boat. Johnson would warn them about the shark that attacked them just a few days prior. The crew, of course, would thank him for his warnings, but would not heed them, and would, of course, regardless of them, proceed with the dive. A massive great white, estimated to be five to six meters long, emerged from the depths with lightning speed and ferocity. The predator struck Repstock with such force that both man and beast were launched one to two meters out of the water. The massive white's razor-sharp teeth and powerful jaws would then lock on to Repstock's left leg. The attack was so sudden that Repstock had no time to react or brace himself for the impact. The ocean surface, which had been calm and inviting just moments before, 
in what was seemingly a blink of an eye transformed into a scene of chaos and primal fear. Repstock's companions, including his brother, were now witnessing a horrifying spectacle unfold just meters away. The sight of a gigantic predator with his jaws clamped around Rob's leg. As the shark and Repstock fell back into the water, the force of the impact would separate them. Despite the intensity of the attack, Repstock managed to maintain his consciousness with the aid of a surge of adrenaline, his survival instincts doing everything they can to keep him alive. He then frantically swims back to the boat where his crewmates would carry him on board, their hands trembling with fear and urgency. While the shark disappeared into the depths for a final time, the crew would then assess Repstock's injuries and take note of the blood-stained water around them as they tried to absorb the brutal encounter they just experienced. The crew then cut the anchor rope and raced towards Government Point, where Repstock would receive medical attention at Lompoc Hospital. His injuries would include a deep laceration on his upper thigh and multiple tooth punctures on his lower leg. The wounds were consistent with a white shark attack, with interspace measurements matching those of a 5.8 meter long shark just like the one Johnson reported to have encountered. Despite the shark's similarity in size, as well as the location of the attack, it was still unclear to investigators whether it was the same shark that attacked both Gary Johnson and Robert Repstock. Research conducted at the Farallon Islands off San Francisco has shown that some white sharks remain within a given home range for varying durations during specific times of the year. In the case of the attacks on Johnson and Repstock, it's therefore very possible that the same shark was patrolling the waters of Point Conception during that fateful week in July of 1975. Robert Repstock, despite his harrowing experience, would make a full recovery and went on to practice law in Santa Barbara after the incident. His story till this day serves as a powerful reminder of the unpredictability of the ocean as well as its inhabitants and underscores the importance of not just understanding but respecting the formidability of our ocean's predators. There have been cases similar to this one, where shark attacks, despite them being widely accepted as rare occurrences, have occurred just days apart from one another. Other than the infamous Jersey Beach shark attacks of 1916, which this channel has covered in detail in a previous episode, one recent string of lesser-known attacks that occurred on back-to-back -back days had also left beachgoers in fear not long ago. In September 2018, two shark attacks occurred within 24 hours of each other in Sid Harbour, a popular tourist destination on Whitsunday Island. On September 19th, a 46-year-old woman named Justine Barwick was attacked by a shark while swimming near her yacht. She suffered significant injuries to her right thigh and was airlifted to a nearby hospital for emergency surgery. The very next day, on September 20th, a 12-year-old girl named Hannah Papps was also attacked by a shark in the same area while swimming with her family. She sustained critical injuries to her right leg, which eventually led to its amputation. After these attacks, authorities closed the beaches in Sid Harbour and conducted a shark control program that involved capturing and killing several sharks in the area. It was not possible to determine if the same shark was responsible for both attacks, but the close proximity and timing of the incidents were certainly alarming. These back-to-back -back attacks highlight the unpredictability of shark behavior and the importance of exercising caution when swimming in areas known for shark activity. While such occurrences are relatively rare, they serve as a reminder that shark encounters can happen at any time, and it is essential to be aware of the risks and take appropriate safety measures. In addition to abalone diving, Robert Rebstock was also an avid surfer. On Sunday, January 29, 2017, however, Robert would tragically surf his last wave. Reports indicated that he'd headed down to a beach at Hollister Ranch at dawn, where people reported seeing him enjoying the surf for a good two hours. He would all of a sudden come in on a wave, according to his law partner, Rob Egonolf, and someone had noticed he wasn't paddling back out. He is survived by his wife, Suzanne, their daughter, Sarah, and their son, Patrick. Today I got a real crazy one for you. And you know what? Thank you, by the way, for all the recommendations that y'all have been giving me in the comments and all the previous videos and stuff like that. It really does help, you know, come up with ideas. And also I do get educated on a lot of attacks that I didn't know about. One of them being Lloyd Skinner. Now I never knew the gravity of this attack. We've heard of Simon Nellis. I did a video on the Shirley Durden attack as well. So you guys can check that out right over here in case y'all haven't already. You know what? This one was a hard read. This was this was definitely one of the tougher ones. Now, 
This story is, it took place in one of the most popular coastal regions in famous Fish Hook Beach. At the time leading up to this attack, there had been an increase in shark sightings. There was one video in particular, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm going to see if I can find it for you and put it here in the post-production. If you can see this shark here, it's huge. And this was one of the sharks that they actually sighted. And there was a picture taken of it, of course. Before this attack once again even occurred, there were numerous calls to the city or to the people that own the beach for an electronic warning system to be installed there uh, for sharks so that beachgoers can be alerted, you know, and swimmers can be out of the water before any tragedy occurs. You know, even though a lot of people were alerted and a lot of people did stay out of the water, one of these people ended up suffering a traumatic attack and that's a man by the name of Lloyd Skinner. He was a 37-year-old engineer from Harare, Zimbabwe, which is in East Africa. He'd been on holiday for his uh, partner's daughter's wedding at the time. So apparently the way it happened was he was out swimming in roughly chest deep water. He started adjusting his goggles and as he was doing this, a shadow kind of comes out, a huge shadow uh, comes out not far away from him and starts approaching him. And before he could even react, this thing just grabs him and pulls him under. A lot of these people actually said that this shark was so big that they said it was easily as big or not even, maybe even bigger than a minibus. Okay, so this shark was literally a monster. They literally just saw goggles and a whole bun in a whole pool of blood, just a whole patch of blood just surface after. And it was just a horrifying scene, you know what I mean? And I'm going to tell you guys right now, uh, the people, they, they literally were so traumatized, like the quotes from this was just really hard to read as well. So there was an eyewitness, his name was Greg Coppin. Um, his quote, uh, what he said was, and this is all taken from an article, I'm going to pin it. Uh, it's from The Guardian. I'm going to pin it in the uh, description for you guys. So Greg Coppin, uh, he was present at the scene. He stood helplessly as the enormous ocean predator, which was apparently so massive that he referred to it as dinosaur huge when he was describing it. Um, and anyone uses the word dinosaur, like, you know, that's, the, you know, they're, they're thinking massive. And in his own words, this is what he described, okay? He said, it was this giant shadow heading towards something colorful. Then it sort of came out of the water and it took this colorful lump and it went off with it. You could see its whole jaw wrap around the thing, which of course turned out to be a person. And then there was another eyewitness. Her name was Phyllis McCartan. She'd actually been visiting from Britain. And according to her, the shark had Lloyd's body in its mouth and his arm was in the air. And then all of a sudden, the sea was just full of blood. It must have been traumatizing for the people watching this too, right? How do you get that image out of your head of somebody being eaten alive? by a shark in front of you. There's nothing you can do about it, nothing they can do about it. It's not their domain, it's not our domain as humans in the water. And another eyewitness at the scene, his name was Kyle Johnston. So t take, a, take in like how many people probably needed psychological therapy after this. He was swimming only about 15 meters away uh, from Skinner and he recalled looking at the walkway and noticing people frantically waving their towels. And this whole time he thinks this is a joke. He's just like, you know, people are trolling uh, at the shore, you know, whatever. So he's smiling, he's laughing, but then he notices these guys aren't stopping. So he turns around and he sees a big fin and there's just dark water, dark blood red water. Just it's immersed in that, like that fin. And, and he sees goggles as well. It's like something straight out of a horror movie, right? And obviously like he's just kind of... He's just kind of stunned, so he's just glaring at it for a few seconds. And what happens is, and this is even more horror-like, you know, um, Skinner's legs, or one of his legs rather, protrude from this uh, from the water, and just it's immersed in all this soup of his blood. And the goggles are there, and his leg just rises. That's horrifying, and this has happened in real life. You know what I mean? And this has happened in South Africa, which is very popular for great white shark attacks. It's actually one of the only places in the world where great white sharks, especially the, there's this bay there. I'm going to put the pin it here for you. I can't remember the name off the top of my head right now, but I'm going to pin it here for you. It's a bay in South Africa where it's the only place in the world where they're known to jump out of and breach the waters like with their full bodies. You know what I mean? I'm sure you all have seen that. And you, uh, YouTube Air Jaws. Air Jaws is crazy. So then the aftermath was, I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. I'm just going to put it and give it to you in a nutshell. Despite intense efforts from rescuers to help salvage at least a part of Lloyd for his family, uh, they were inevitably forced to call off the search. Uh, they felt like at this point their efforts 
any efforts to do so would be futile, you know, or to look for him. Because according to Ian Klopper, who was a spokesman for the National Sea Rescue Institute, he was quoted saying that you can rule out the chance of finding him alive completely. Whether we find body parts, it's very unlikely that we'll find any body parts. Uh, but we think that the shark really did take everything. Like, so every part of this man, beside the goggles. So that's it. So that's the story of Lloyd Skinner in a nutshell. You know, I try to make it as short as possible, this one. See, it's said that more than 70% of shark attacks, or around 70% of shark attacks that occur on humans is usually a shark taking a, an exploratory bite and they usually leave after that. The human either dies out or gets medical attention on time or it's not too major, that bite. But you see, 30% can also result in what this story did, unfortunately, tragically resulted in. And that was the death of Lloyd Skinner. May he rest in peace. He was unfortunately part of that 30%. And given the size and the sheer force of this attack and the predatory nature of it, it seems it most likely was a great white by the eyewitness accounts as well and i'll tell you he was unfortunately the part of that 30 percent where the shark actually bites the victim and comes back and finishes them off and consumes them but well, this has happened this happened with shirley durden i'll leave that one as well in the end screen for y'all by the way uh this is animal al this is me welcoming you to when animals attack just like and subscribe if you're new hit that notifications bell it doesn't always work a lot of y'all don't get that notification um but uh, do check out the murder by snake story i'm gonna leave it in the end screen and check out that uh chimp attack story that i just put down of uh, mo the chimp i'm not sure if y'all have heard of that but it's one of the craziest stories ever same with murder by snake it's a man that murdered his wife via snake bite it's an insane story it happened in india in kerala to be specific and the other one had taken place in California, uh, the chimp attack. So do check it out. And once again, y'all have yourself a good one. I'm going to go rest. I'm super tired. Peace. If this video piqued your interest, then our previous compilation, featuring some of nature's most brutal animal attacks, is likely to do the same. You can find it on the end screen of this video.